Confrontations continue in Al-Quds as Israeli occupation forces stormed the squares of Al-Aqsa Mosque while the worshippers were attending prayers during Ramadan, fired rubber bullets, tear gas and stun grenades and arrested a number of Palestinian natives who responded fearlessly. At a time when the Palestinians were awaiting the date the illegal colonial settlers set to storm Al-Aqsa Mosque days before Eid al-Fitr, the occupation forces preceded the settlers by storming the mosque, attacking worshippers and closing Al-Aqsa Mosque completely. The world watched in real time via social media the escalatory step, the largest in years, that triggered condemnation of all resistance factions who told the occupation to await the resistance response at any moment. The Israeli attack continued for hours, where worshippers were arrested as the violence even reached the call to prayer room and the loudspeaker wires were cut off. This comes as tensions rises in the occupied Al-Quds over the issue of the Sheikh al-Jarrah neighborhood, which has turned into a daily clash with the Israeli occupation in an attempt by the Palestinians to protect the neighborhood's residents from the risk of illegal eviction. Over the past week, Al-Quds went through harsh hours interspersed with the violent clashes with the occupation, which allowed illegal colonial settlers in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood to attack an iftar table prepared by Palestinians in front of homes threatened with eviction. To add salt to the injury, leader of the religious Zionism party, Yair bin Ghafir, installed a tent office for him in the neighborhood, which was enough to blow up the situation and push the fasting Palestinian natives to break the tent. The occupation forces then arrested dozens of Jerusalemites and wounded many others, while the media monitored settlers carrying machine guns and pistols, directing them towards unarmed Palestinians to terrorize them. What's to give in all of this injustice as the world watches live Israel's incremental genocide against the native Palestinians? Armed resistance and liberation. Welcome to the Middle Stream, I'm Marwa Osman. Native Palestinians carried on with their solidarity protests against forced displacement of families from the occupied East Al-Quds as Israeli occupation forces continued to raid the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood in the occupied city, spraying skunk water, which is literally a chemically enhanced type of sewage water, and physically assaulting Palestinian residents and solidarity protesters. Now, these protests intensified, reaching Al-Aqsa Mosque, where Hundreds of Palestinians were wounded in confrontations with the occupation forces at one of Islam's holiest shrines and also in other parts of the city. To discuss this issue with us from Sydney is Jay Therapel, political writer and commentator. Thank you for being with us, Jay. Now, the same Israeli uh, accord that has ruled that another seven native Palestinian families are going to lose their homes in Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, they are supposed to leave their homes before August 1st for illegal colonial settlers to bring their stuff in and just sit inside of the Palestinian homes. I've never seen a court order that rules with such blatant hypocrisy, unless it is obviously from inside the uh, occupied Palestinian territories with the Israeli regime. Uh, the Judaization of Al-Quds, what we are seeing today, is happening right under the nose of the UN and what is called the international community. This has been going on for 73 years, Jay. What makes this one any different? There's really no difference. Uh, everything's just gotten worse for the Palestinians, unfortunately. And ever since Trump recognized, uh, you know, from the American perspective, that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, that was back in December uh, 2017, all of the various Israeli settler organizations have been emboldened and they've been encouraged to push harder for, for the ethnic cleansing of East Jerusalem. Um, so you mentioned the UN. I mean, in the past, the United States and other Western governments, they were more hesitant to legitimize Israeli control over East Jerusalem and the West Bank. And that's because those territories are illegally occupied according to international law, meaning that any settlements built in these territories are also illegal uh, as far as the UN is concerned. 
Um, so today, the Israeli Supreme Court ruled to defer the decision on the eviction of the, the seven families from their homes in Sheikh Jarrah by, by August the 1st, as you mentioned, most likely because it's generating bad publicity, especially when you look at the facts of the case. Um, back in 1982, when the Palestinian families of Sheikh Jarrah were being threatened with eviction, they were betrayed by their Israeli lawyer who signed over their land without even telling them. This turned them into protected tenants. Uh, which meant that they would have to pay rent to an Israeli settler organization, which claims it has ownership documents from the Ottoman Empire dating back to 1875. <laughs> but the Palestinians say that those documents are completely forged. So in 1997, one of the Palestinian residents named Suleiman Hijazi, he produced the title deeds from the Ottoman uh, archives proving his ownership over many plots of land, but the Israeli courts rejected that mm -hmm. in 2005 because of that 1982 legal betrayal. Um, and finally, in March 2009, uh, 2009 um, the relevant Turkish record-keeping uh, office, which has all of the Ottoman records, they wrote a letter that Hijazi produced in court, which basically stated that there are no Ottoman title deeds matching the claims of the Israeli settlers. And obviously, but still, the Israelis did not precedent. even accept that, obviously. But Israel is right no. now trying so hard to erase Jerusalem's Palestinians. It is made colonial violence a permanent feature of uh, native Palestinian lives in the holy city of Al-Quds Sharif. How do you think the scene will evolve in Al-Aqsa with more than 300 wounded now and there are a lot of uh, talk about certain martyrs that we've never, uh, we've not heard about yet uh, and elsewhere also uh, around Al-Quds and the occupied West Bank. How do you think this will uh, maybe evolve uh, as Israel prepares to build its first illegal colonial settlement in Al-Quds? Well, this is clearly the beginning of another wave of uh, attempted ethnic cleansing. So I think you can expect mass protests from the Palestinians. And the Israelis, are, I think, are slightly worried about this, which is probably why they've announced that they're going to delay the eviction. Uh, the conditions are ripe for mass protests because Israel is experiencing major political divisions, even among its majority settler population. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are protests against uh, you know, Netanyahu because he's on trial for corruption, which means that the conditions are are really ripe um, for for protests to be taking uh, uh, taking off mm -hmm. um, in East Jerusalem against the Israeli occupation. Well, it is frankly nauseating for me when I hear certain commentators in general, and specifically Palestinian uh, ones from the authority, from the Palestinian Authority, who just like throw or throw around all sorts of cliches like a uh, cycle of violence or they call for a return of calm uh, and generally engage in both sides are to be blamed or there is no right and wrong side uh, in that game there are Look, there are no two equal sides right now inside of all of occupied Palestine. What options do you think the Palestinians have to make sure that their authority fully understands and hears them? Look, if the Palestinians on the ground feel like the Palestinian authority of uh, Mahmoud Abbas refuses to stand up for their legitimate national interests, then I suppose it would be in their interest to point out that the PA was not elected. Uh, there was an election in 2006 which Hamas won, regardless of what anyone thinks about them. Mm -hmm. Not only did Mahmoud Abbas refuse to step down, but his faction received military aid from Israel to fight off Hamas, uh, which actually was elected to rule. Um, so the PA has no democratic mandate to represent Palestine. So the question that remains for the Palestinians is whether they, uh, whether they demand to be granted the same legal rights as Israeli citizens in the hopes of moving towards a one-state solution somehow, uh, or whether they demand that the PA calls elections. But that's still kind of thinking in terms of the two-state solution. Um, so they've got their backs to the apartheid wall. Uh, the mm -hmm. Palestinians really are at the mercy of, of world public opinion, uh, which explains why the Israelis have put so much effort into lobbying for big tech censorship all over the world so that the public is obstructed from seeing the truth of what's happening to Palestine. Back in 2016, Facebook began openly collaborating with Israel to shut down Palestinian voices inside the West Bank. Mm -hmm. And if we're to be perfectly honest, we can see the effects of that. I mean, I remember the, the outrage back in 2000 when I was very young, uh, when Ariel Sharon visited the Al-Aqsa compound 
And uh, just that alone sparked the second intifada and there were protests all over the world and the Muslim world is very upset. Mm -hmm. But you look at that, you compare that today. Today, over 300 Palestinians were injured after Israeli soldiers stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which in the past used to offend Muslims all over the world. But mm -hmm. given the unprecedented level of big tech censorship in ways that favor Israel, it becomes increasingly obvious that Muslim YouTubers and content producers are giving far less attention to Palestine than they used to. And that's a major problem. That's a very major problem and I, I'm sure we should be looking into that furthermore but I want to ask you about the election option. You said that uh, Palestinians maybe should ask the, uh, the authority, uh, their Palestinian authority for elections but Israel's violence does not just stop at evictions, demolitions and and um, uh, ethnic cleansing. They, last week they unequivocally indicated that it would not allow the Palestinians uh, legislative elections originally scheduled for May 22nd to be held in East Jerusalem where we have more than 400,000 Palestinians is living. How much more pushing and pressure do you think the Palestinian youth can take? My you know, my impression is that since around 2006, the Palestinians of, of the West Bank, they've been spared the worst of the Israeli occupation, whereas Gaza's experience um, uh, has actually experienced the worst. Um, but what the kind of recent of uh, recent news shows is that even when uh, Palestinians lay down their weapons, Israel will just keep grabbing more land. I mean, they're using that apartheid wall as an advancing front line to separate uh, the northern part of the West Bank from the southern part. Um, and so the problem for the Palestinians is that they're behind enemy lines. Uh, they have, um, you know, their uh, the, the the problem is that they. Um, because they've got their backs to the wall, um, you know, they, they're cut off from the rest of the, uh, mm -hmm. the West Bank and therefore the old methods of armed resistance are far more difficult now than, than, than during the first two intifadas, which means that the only kind of effective forms of resistance that the Palestinians have left are political and diplomatic. Mm -hmm. But the problem here is that uh, some countries are simply addicted to Palestinian victimhood and that's because it serves their own selfish agendas. So, for example, sure. Turkey and Qatar. They're going to use their media networks to support the protests, which, of course, is very important for Erdogan because he likes to present himself as the leader of the Muslims from, from time but, to time. But it is not uh, working out as they uh, wish it would, especially right now in Al-Quds and in Al-Aqsa Mosque as Israel uh, closes it down in the face of the uh, uh, praying and the face of the uh, prayers uh, uh, in uh, Al-Quds al-Sharif. I want to thank you very much, Jay Therapil, political writer and commentator, for joining us to talk about the plight of the Palestinian people in the face of the uh, Zionist occupation. Thank you for being with us. Please stay tuned. Next, we will be talking about Yemen. Yemenis from all walks of life took to the streets of Sana'a to mark the International Quds Day to express solidarity with Palestinians. The protesters raised Palestinian flags and chanted slogans in support of the Palestinian people and said any normalization of ties with the Israeli regime is a great betrayal. Meanwhile, the supply of aid to Yemen and the lifting of the blockade is still to be implemented as it would save countless lives. Halting all Saudi bombardment campaigns and restricting the movement of Saudi-funded Al-Qaeda extremists might be an effective start to end the humanitarian disaster in Yemen. More details in this forum report. Hundreds of thousands of Yemenis took to the streets of the capital Sana'a as well as many other provinces such as Sada and Damar in response to Imam Khomeini's everlasting call to commemorate the International Quds Day which falls every year on the last Friday of the holy month of Ramadan. The masses that poured in the Yemeni streets astonished Zionist Israel and its new Arab buddies. The sight of hundreds of thousands who are suffering from a human-made humanitarian crisis and still witness Saudi bombs falling on their heads, choosing to side by the Palestinian brothers, was just too much for the pro-Zionist camp to watch. 
This led the Saudi war machine on Friday to kill at least seven civilians after warplanes of the Saudi-led military coalition launched an airstrike on a group of people preparing for a pro-Palestine rally in Yemen's northern province of Ma'rib. The aerial aggression was carried out against Sahari village in Majzar district, where at least three other civilians were also wounded. Meanwhile, in Sana'a and other Yemeni provinces, participants raised slogans related to the occasion, flags of Yemen and Palestine, banners that denounced the Zionist occupation, as well as banners in protest against the U.S. policy in the region. In the same respect, leader of the Ansarullah revolutionary movement Sayyid Abdul Malik Badiddin al-Houthi stressed in his Quds Day speech that the Yemeni people will continue unwaveringly in their adherence, supporting the Palestinian people to liberate Palestine, the holy sites, and the rest of the occupied Arab territories. Sayyid al-Houthi also renewed his calls for the Saudi regime to release the Palestinian detainees held in the kingdom's prisons in exchange of releasing Saudi servicemen held in Yemen. All the while, Yemen is witnessing the world's biggest humanitarian crisis. 24 million people, both citizens as well as refugees, need immediate assistance. Widespread famine has thousands in its grips. Another 2 million are on the edge of survival and perishing. With the COVID-19 pandemic also in full swing, conditions could not be direr in the country. Yet the world outside Yemen feel it is not necessary to engage with the crisis and the distress it is causing, simply because the Western regimes are making good money out of the Yemeni suffering. Now to discuss this issue with us from Copenhagen is Rune Ayahus, who's the chairman of the Yemen Solidarity Council. Thank you for being with us. Rune, now hundreds of thousands of Yemenis took to the streets of Sana'a and hundreds of thousands also took to the streets of other governorates in uh, Yemen to commemorate the International Al-Quds Day 2021 in support of the oppressed nation of Palestine while they themselves are still suffering from Saudi bombardment, from Saudi blockade, all blessed by the U.S. imperial power. How do you reflect on such a scene from inside a war-torn country? Well, I'm not exactly surprised um, at this uh, huge gathering of solidarity by the Yemeni people towards the Palestinian cause, simply because the Yemeni people have always been um, the only people, if you so will, in the Arabian Peninsula that has that have always been supportive of the Palestinian people, even contrary to or contradicting, uh, for example, the previous regimes of Ali Abdullah Saleh that tried to appease U.S. Uh, interests and U.S. powers in the region, and also uh, leaked documents a few months ago shows that. Uh, the Saleh regime tried to um, uh, work towards a normalization with the Zionist entity. But even despite that, the Yemeni people have always been on the side of the Palestinians, and it has become a, uh, a, a, a larger sight to behold after the uh, September 21st revolution back in 2014, where uh, Sayyid Abdel Malik Badr Din Houthi once stated that the Palestinian issue the Palestinian cause in relation to the Yemeni revolution is the guiding factor, it's the sole cause, it's the uh, it's, it's our primary cause in relation to the Yemeni revolution. So, so it's, I, I think it's uh, remarkable that, that even despite all the suffering, all of the bombardments and the terror imposed on the Yemeni people, they still, uh, to this day, valiantly put the Palestinian issue at mm -hmm. the forefront, even at the forefront of their own um, causes. Rune, we, we did see and hear that, as you just mentioned, by a leader of the Ansarullah revolutionary movement, Sayyid Abdul Malik al-Houthi, who stressed in his Al-Quds Day speech that uh, the uh, issue of liberating Palestine will remain the Arab and the Muslims' first and central cause. This is his words. Uh, from one small group of resistance fighters in South Lebanon to a complete allied forces of resistance that just uh, goes all across the uh, region of West Asia, uh, now threatening the existence of the Israeli apartheid entity, uh, all the way to Yemen, going through Syria, Iraq, Palestine. What can Yemen offer their Palestinian brothers and sisters while they themselves are suffering? Well, um, right now as it is, uh, they have the power and the, um, the skills uh, to mobilize 
popular support for the Palestinian people, not only the uh, Palestinian cause in itself, but uh, in particular also the Palestinian armed struggle that has been ongoing ever since uh, the Nakba of 1948. So they have that to, to deliver and to, um, to coordinate with the Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. um, who knows what will happen in the future, perhaps if a if a war is imminent or if a third intifada is right around the corner, I'm sure um, the Ansarullah would be able to at least coordinate maybe intelligence, considering also that the Israeli forces are uh, cooperating with uh, the, the Emirati forces, in particular in Socotra, the uh, island of Socotra in, uh, uh, in the Gulf of Aden, to they, they're building uh, bases, uh, intelligence operations on the island. So I'm, I think they'll be able to, you know, coordinate intelligence. But right now, what we are seeing is uh, is what they'll um, be able to uh, to offer the Palestinian people. Well, uh, the warfare has been escalating, particularly in the northern governorate of Ma'rib, where uh, Saudi mercenaries are falling faster than expected, to be honest with you. What is the main goal for Mohammed bin Salman for keeping a hold or desiring to keep a hold on Ma'rib like it's the last thing he'll ever do? Well, Ma'rib is, is the symbolically last stronghold of the exiled Hadi regime. It's, it's where most of, of uh, the government institutions are located, if not in, in Aden, of course. And it's also the, the city that is, of course, symbolically shows that or paints a picture that the Hadi regime is in some ways a functioning state. But we all know that might or is not the case. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's, it's symbolic. But it's also uh, strategically important because it holds a lot of oil and a lot of gas that uh, is meant to supply uh, most of uh, the entire country. And, and right now they have that under control. But if they lose that, they don't really have anything to bargain with. They can't uh, cut off uh, oil or gas supplies to Sana'a and the rest of the Western governorates. Um, and and they, can't, they don't really have that bargaining chip to deal with. So by, by keeping a hold on Merib as a last-ditch resort and, and to uh, um, uh, you know, send troops in that get killed almost instantly and you know, to sacrifice so many people just to keep this city, it shows that it holds significant importance to both the Saudi coalition but also to the Hadi regime. Well, we have more than 20 million between citizens and refugees who are in need of assistance in the face of the Saudi war machine and the Saudi blockade that is suffocating the people. Now, the humanitarian situation in Yemen is just falling off a cliff. What options do you think that the Yemenis have to at least take a step backward from the current inevitable cliff? Well, I don't think the question is uh, what options the Yemeni people have to do or to, to take a step back from falling off the cliff. I think the question is um, uh, what can the international community do to not push the Yemeni people off the cliff? Because we all know that the... Um, most Are they of the still suffering... alive? Do they really see what's going on in Yemen? <laughs> I don't know. They've been uh, remarkably silent, I, I mean, uh, with... I mean, all it took in Washington was uh, a few... Um, uh, activist the hunger strike to really get things going but um, but yeah the international community needs to realize that the blockade on Yemen is what um, is what most of Yemeni people are suffering from the malnutrition the the lack of food and and uh, vital imports from Hodeida is all attributed to the Saudi imposed siege and blockade on Yemen it's not as much about what does the Yemeni people have to do, it's about the international community that has to realize that not only is the United, uh, United Nations uh, Security Council Resolution 2216 that uh, it puts all blame on Ansarullah, it has flawed and it has flawed for the past six years, but they also have to realize that the blockade is killing people and it's not just about, you know, uh, preventing arms to uh, coming into Yemen and, and, and weapons and what have you. It's about, the blockade is, is, is actively blockading 
vital food and imports and people are dying from it. They have to realize that it's a blockade. Well, I'm going to thank you very much, Hun Aya, who's chairman of the Yemen Solidarity Council, for joining us to talk about how the Yemenis are actually supporting their brothers and sisters in Palestine while they themselves are suffering the, from the Saudi war machine. Thank you very much for being with us, and thank you for watching. Please stay tuned next week for more from the Mideast stream.